KSR Corrosion Part 3. Uh, we're dealing with phosphate boiler water treatment. Uh, first thing we'd like to say is a disclaimer. This is for information only. Um, this is not the complete process in phosphate control. Uh, it's not meant to challenge your chemistry professionals or the people in charge of boiler water. It's just to give kind of an idea of what's going on and what to be aware of. Um, we're dealing with orthophosphates. We have our monosodium phosphate, one sodium, one phosphate has a one sodium to one phosphate ratio. Disodium phosphate, two sodiums, one phosphate, two to one ratio. And trisodium phosphate, three sodiums, one phosphate. This is what is used in boiler water treatment um, predominantly. These are all a buffer. A buffer is a mixture of an acid and a base. Um, it, it can compensate for an acidic condition and also an alkaline condition. These compounds are added to the steam drum. Uh, monosodium phosphate and phosphoric acid, they decrease the pH by adding hydrogen ions. Possible to use phosphoric acid. I don't know of anybody doing it, but usually use monosodium phosphate thing about these, they can change states in the boiler depending on pH. So you can add monosodium phosphate, you will react with trisodium phosphate, and drop the pH by forming a disodium phosphate. So it depends on the pH of which of these species is in the water. Uh, the disodium phosphate adds nothing to change the pH. The trisodium phosphate increases pH by reverse hydrolysis. This will liberate OH ions. Also can liberate sodium hydroxide ions in the right pH range. How these work, the belief is you have iron cations, a plus two charge. They go into solution. In order to do this, you have to have an electrons. Two electrons have to be liberated that flow to the cathode. Um, it requires the hydrogen ions to absorb these electrons. Uh, the OH inhibits the hydrogen ions, so it limits the corrosion on the cathodic part of the metal. Caustic increases pH, direct addition of OH. The main problem with phosphate control and caustics in boilers, you have caustic corrosion. In the 1920s and 30s, uh, probably before then, Caustic embrittlement was a major problem. It caused cracking in highly stressed areas. This would be where it was riveted, rolled in tubes. Um, it required a high sodium hydroxide was required to form this. Even though the boiler water may have had low levels, it was capable of concentrating in areas if there's any leaks or under plates that were hot. Um, it could develop fairly high levels of sodium hydroxide. One of the reasons this was added to boilers, it took care of your calcium and magnesium hardness. It made a calcium and magnesium phosphate that dropped out as a light sludge. This was easily blown out of the mud drums of the boilers. Today, we still use phosphate. Um, you can have deposits in high heat absorbing surfaces. They can cause caustic OH to form. It concentrates normally a pitting or gouging phenomenon. This can be a problem in high tubes with high heat flux rates. Instead of having nucleate boiling, you'll get film boiling. Uh, this will actually plate out on the tube metal. We'll talk about this later. Uh, if you have a scale in the boiler too, you can form caustic pits that get high levels of caustic. Above a 12 pH, it attacks your iron, protective iron oxide, by complexing the iron by the OH. So too high a pH is corrosive to metal, and low pH is corrosive to metal. Uh, the easiest way to screw up a boiler is to get your chemistry way off. If you have a low pH and high oxygen, you can do tremendous damage to a boiler fairly quickly. So this is one area where you can destroy a lot of equipment and boilers without really knowing you're doing it. That's why it's so important to monitor your chemistry and have people in charge that understand all the processes of chemicals. K 
Okay, this is the coordinated phosphate control. Uh, there's two types of phosphate control, coordinated and congruent. This section will talk about the coordinated. Uh, it's pH control. It's designed to maintain alkalinity conditions while avoiding free hydroxide ions. Um, one thing you have to be aware of, amines and ammonia can affect the pH ratio. You need to compensate for ammonia-induced errors. So if you add an ammonium hydroxide to your condensate, it show up in your boiler drums and it'll skew the pH a little bit. This is your free caustic range. You want to stay out of here. Uh, this is based on the trisodium phosphate curve. Basically, this is for lower pressure boilers. From here, this way is 1,000 PSI. From here is 1,000 to 2,000 PSI. Higher pressure boilers will have a different curve. The purpose is to furnish enough phosphate, PO4, to scavenge any hardness leaking into the condensate or feed water. If you have a leak on your condenser, you could be bringing in calcium and magnesium bicarbonates that form carbonates in the boiler and form scaling. With PO4, they'll react with the PO4 and form calcium magnesium phosphates. This is a light fluffy product that can be blown out of the boiler. You won't get the scale buildup on tubes. Hydroxide alkalinity, uh, the OH, can contribute to caustic gouging under deposits. It can cause caustic embrittlement, and you can also get hydrogen damage to the metal. This can concentrate the hydroxide. If you have sodium hydroxide in the water, it can be concentrated at very high levels under deposits since the steam, the water's boiled off and the caustic accumulates. So it's quite possible to have very high caustic levels, even though your boiler water doesn't have it. You need to operate under the trisodium phosphate curve. If pH is too high, add monosodium phosphate or phosphoric acid. Um, people probably add the monosodium phosphate, don't maybe add phosphoric acid. These can be used to lower the pH and get back out of the free caustic range. Caustic film attack on overheated tubes. This can be the result of tube areas that have excessively high heat flux. Instead of having nucleate boiling, you'll have film or sheet boiling, and the compounds in the water will concentrate on the metal. And the more thicker layer of deposits, the less heat transfer you have. So you can overheat tubes and do heat damage to tubes. Excessive magnetite formation, thick laminar layers that can overheat the tubes. Well, magnetite's a good thing in thin layers. Too thick layers can inhibit the heat flow through the tubes and overheat the tubes. Okay, this is the infamous phosphate hideout. Anybody's used phosphate treatment boilers have probably experienced phosphate hideout. Uh, if the concentration of phosphate in boiler water is too high for the temperature pressure, Phosphate will react with boiler scale, forming iron and sodium phosphates, or precipitate to form a solid phase on the hot tube surfaces. It can release OH, or sodium hydroxide can be released during this process. Uh, if you have levels on the tube with high heat flux, the sodium phosphate can directly precipitate on the tube. If it's high enough, it can uh, keep, start the tubes overheating Usually it's not enough of a problem to create overheating. If you have a dirty boiler, you can have more iron and sodium phosphates forming. Uh, hideout and boiler tube corrosion can occur where accumulation of deposits or an inadequate mass flow. If you get film boiling in the tubes instead of nucleic boiling, it will concentrate the minerals. The total dissolved solids in the water will concentrate you can get very high accumulations of sodium hydroxide on areas of the boiler, even though the boiler water has very little of it in it. Solubility of phosphates decrease with increasing boiler pressure. Only noticed during load changes, uh, about 200 degrees or so, it starts wanting to drop a little. 400 degrees, it really starts dropping out of the water. So phosphate is very depend dependent on the pressures and temperatures. During hideout, you might see the sodium go way above the ratio 
You could be above the three to one ratio of sodium to phosphate because you're getting sodium hydroxide being released. The severity of hideout is related to the heat flux, temperature, pressure, and boiler cleanliness. If you have deposits in the boiler, your phosphate's probably going to end up hiding out there. Phosphate should not exceed equilibrium. This kind of goes to congruent phosphate control. Basically, your load goes up, pH goes up, load drops, pH drops. One thing you have to be careful of, you drop load and the pH drops, you put more phosphate in, this phosphate is going to be released that's tied up here as the boiler pressure and temperature drop. So you overshoot the phosphate, the next time you go back up, you'll have more height out. So you can kind of create a problem here where it's, you keep concentrating the phosphates in the boiler. Congruent phosphate control is similar to coordinated, except sodium to phosphate molar ratio is intentionally controlled. Uh, we're at a ratio around 2.6 to 1. This is a chart over here of the pH. You have your phosphate parts per million, sodium to phosphate molar ratio in here. Basically at 2400 PSI, it'd be in this region. Uh, about the highest you go is five parts per million phosphate. Your pH range would be about a 9.4 to a 9.0. At three, be down about 8.6 to 9.2, one five. So this kind of shows you the pH is related to the phosphate parts per million. And try sitting phosphate should give you a 2.6 to one ratio. You don't want to go below a 2.2 to one ratio of sodium to phosphate. Here we have a 2.6 to 1 sodium to phosphate. The next pressure range 15 to 2400 and go to 2.7 down to 900 to 1500 go to 2.8 to 1. So a lower pressure boiler you run 10 pH 15 on the phosphate. Up here you have free caustic you don't want to go up this part of the range. And down here, you're not getting adequate control. So you control that a specific pH to phosphate ratio of 2.6 prevents the formation of a concentrated caustic solution in the event of a phosphate precipitation or hideout. So this is basically looking at if you're swinging a lot, you want to keep your phosphates lower so you don't get a lot of free caustic form during high load operation. Equilibrium concentration, the max concentration of PO4, the boiler water can tolerate under the highest heat flux. So the phosphate, you want to look at your highest load that boiler is going to put out, and that's what you're going to base your um, phosphate on. Here's this little vector diagram that shows if you're down here, low on pH, you can add caustic and bring your pH back up into one of these ranges, or you can use trisodium phosphate. You'll add phosphate and also bring up the pH. Disodium phosphate only brings up the phosphate, does not change the pH. Monosodium phosphate, it'll drop the pH. That won't change the ratio any. Or you can just blow down. Probably the most common is to blow down, add more boiler water instead of adding other chemicals. Anytime you start adding chemicals, to counteract, you tease it overshoot, then you end up chasing the problem and create a lot more problems doing it. So this is kind of a very basic phosphate hideout. Anybody uses phosphate and boilers that change load a lot, you're going to experience phosphate hideout. Usually it's not a problem on clean boilers and if you control it adequately, but if you don't, it can create problems of tube failures and other items in the boiler in time.